Hey there, it's Amy. I am beyond excited today. Those of you who have been listening for a while know that I kind of nerd out when I am interviewing someone that I've been following for a long time. And Melanie Potok, who we have here today, is one of those people. Melanie is so awesome. She has these like really accessible knowledgeable thoughts around feeding kids. And so in my book, she is the perfect guest to be here today to talk to us about So You Want to Raise an Adventurous Eater. Um, so whether you have a picky eater or you just have a kid who's a kid, I think on all of our minds, especially us parents who love food and are really interested in feeding our kids healthy food, this is probably something you've thought about. So I'm gonna dig in with Melanie today around just like what are some of the really practical steps that we as parents can take to help at least do our part in making our kids adventurous eaters. And maybe she'll also tell us what we can't do. Um, so <laughs> Melanie, thank you for being here today. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking the time to find a spot for us to chat because I know we've been trying to do this for a while. So. <laughs> Yay, we did it. <laughs> Absolutely. Melanie is very in demand, so I am honored to have her here. And Melanie, I, I know I didn't do you justice with your bio, so before I dive into asking you all the questions, I think it would be awesome if you could just give us a little overview of, of the work that you do, and then at the end of the episode, we'll cover all the places folks can find you, because I know they're going to want to learn more. Sure. Well, um, I guess if I was meeting you at a cocktail party tonight, and all of your friends who are listening, I would... I usually just start by saying, I work with families who have kids who are picky. And that can be anything from kind of your garden variety picky eater to very, very extreme picky eating. And that's because I'm a certified speech language pathologist and I specialize in what we call pediatric feeding. And that kind of led to being an author of four books and I'm a producer of a children's music CD. Um, and I speak all around the world to audiences, both parents and professionals in pediatric feeding about how to help these kids really get on the path to adventure eating. So I'm, I'm basically all about kids and food. <laughs> yes. And, and you are about food yourself with just so that people know kind of the baseline is something I love about you is that you are also an adventurous eater. So I think that brings so much to your cool perspective on like building this in kids as well. Yeah, I was really raised that way. I was raised that we try all kinds of foods. My parents were also very adventurous. And then I had my own two children and God gave me a very adventurous eater right away where I thought to myself, I am so good at this. <laughs> don't we do something with our first where you're like, I'm just, yeah. I'm just have kids who talk really well. It must yeah. be. I'm, I'm really so fun. good at this. I seriously <laughs> thought I had done this. And then I, and then God gave me my second daughter who was a very picky eater. And that's when I realized that there are so many factors other than parenting and parenting comes into play. I get that but so many factors that change the way we intend to parent. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I got to thinking about this and later on went on to graduate school to become a speech pathologist and started working in the hospital at the NICU and it just took off from there. But I credit my picky eater for setting me on this path because it is a really tough road when you have a child who doesn't wanna try new foods and is genuinely scared to do so. Yeah. I, before I dig into that, because I have so many questions about it, I was just thinking this theme keeps coming up of like, where can you make your limitations your superpower or your challenges your yeah. superpower? So it's so cool to hear that this challenge, it sounds like a very difficult challenge, actually led you to this purpose of helping so many people. It, it definitely led me there. And also, I think I have there's a different degree of empathy because I've walked mm -hmm. in those shoes mm -hmm. and, um, and I just try to always help my parents understand we will get there. We'll get to your goals. We'll get to eating more foods. I know the light at the end of the tunnel. Just <laughs> let me lead the way. Um, but it's, it's not going to be easy. It's not an easy journey. It never is. Yeah. So what are some of the main causes of picky eating in that way. I know there must be hundreds of them, but if we are listening and we're not like dealing with super extreme picky eating where we need, we have seen professional support because our parents are very proactive who listen. What about like just general garden variety? Like I like this thing, I don't like it, this thing. Why, why is that? Because it can be so frustrating. 
Yeah. Well, you know, just the garden variety picky eater, we, as you know, we expect kids to go through kind of a picky eating phase right at about eh, kind of like 18 months to even up to age three. It depends on the child. Um, and if nothing else influences that, and it's just part of natural development, the reason why that happens is because they're reaching that stage where they're starting to figure out the power of no. Mm -hmm. And they're supposed to, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, which is figuring out that if I, as a little toddler, think and act a certain way, I will actually influence mommy and daddy to think and act a certain way. And they're supposed to have that separation where prior to that, they kind of don't really understand that mom's one whole being who thinks, and I'm another being who thinks. Right. Well, so we want kids to explore that. And one of the reasons they explore it, as we explain in my book, Raising a Healthy, Happy Eater, is that as they start to enter what we call the terrific twos, um, that they are trying a lot of things on for size, especially the word no. And because we start to hear no, we hear protests a lot from our two-year-olds, we tend to respond to those by stopping offering certain foods. So one of the best ways for any parent to make sure that the child moves through that natural phase of picky eating but emerges out the other side with no problem is to continue to offer a variety and never to, you know, parents don't intend to put pressure on a child, but we accidentally do it just by saying, oh, come on, try it, you know, because we want them to try it so bad. Um, so no, not putting any pressure on the child and just really separating out the fact that as long as we continue to expose our child to variety of foods and offer small amounts over time, that as their, their cognitive growth changes, they'll be able to reason a little bit better and move out of that, that picky mm -hmm. eating trap. Mm -hmm. So just for any parent, that's the number one thing to think about. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. And I heard you say a couple of things that I just want to like pull out for our yeah. listener, which is, um, you know, small portions, which I've heard you talk about before. It's just like yeah. not overloading them, um, doing it over and over again. And this is something that I personally, I totally have been th that mom who is like, my one and a half year old basically eats everything and you know, yeah. he'll be reaching that stage where he'll stop eating everything, but he has never liked avocado. And I've heard uh -huh. myself saying, well, Connor doesn't like avocado. And I was thinking just the other day, you know, maybe someday he will, but if I keep labeling him and this is so basic, right? As yeah. if he doesn't like avocado, then that becomes part of his identity. Right. And he might never even try it. Cause he's like, I don't like that. My mom says I don't. Right. Exactly. That is so true. So true. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling so, you. so am I on the right track that small portions is a part yeah. of that? Yeah. And when I say small portions, I'm talking about a tablespoon, like literally take your, your spoons that you use for baking, take off the tablespoon one and keep that on your counter to help you remember that when you are presenting new foods, just scoop out a tablespoon worth of the food and put it on their plate. So it's the tiniest, tiniest sample. And um, your, the kids are much more likely to try it if there's an extremely small, underwhelming sample on their plate versus a, versus a real scoop, which is what we would typically do. Yes. Yeah. I like that idea of underwhelming. I think it can also separate our um, anxiety as parents or our feeling that sometimes exists of like they're wasting food. Right. A yeah. big thing, right? And it feels less wasteful if it's just this tiny little piece. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I do have a lot of families that I work with who are challenged by food insecurity. And when we are presenting that tablespoon of food, if the child doesn't interact with it or it doesn't have any contact with um, germs, saliva, et cetera, et cetera, then we'll just scoop it back up and put it in an ice cube tray. And throughout the week, we just freeze new pieces of food in that ice cube tray because you can always pop it back out and present it again. Not necessarily that they need to eat it, but it just keeps showing up visually and they can smell it. And um, it's just a great way to make friends with it. Yeah, I, this is something that you talk about a lot is making friends with food. And yeah. I loved your book because it had like so many great examples of things to do with kids. I'm talking about the raising a happy, healthy eater. Uh -huh. um, but can you talk to us a little bit about like, how do you help kids make friends with food? So we know small samples often. Are there other ways that we can like foster that 
relationship, I'm using quotation marks for those of you listening, <laughs> with food, which is kind of a funny concept, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, after I wrote Raising a Healthy Happy Eater with Dr. Namali Fernando, who's a pediatrician in Virginia and one of my dearest friends, uh, I, I honestly immediately started thinking about what the next book would be mm -hmm. because I wanted parents to have a plan around one specific food group and that was vegetables. That's the number one thing I hear, especially this time of year when everybody's making New Year's resolutions that um, they want their kids to learn to eat vegetables. So that's why I wrote Adventures in Veggie Land. I'll hold it up here for you because it's in the background. I don't know, well, it's in focus. Yeah, 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 now we can. <laughs> um, and it's exactly what you're talking about in that it's a three-step plan to help children learn to love vegetables. And those three steps are my three E's, expose, explore, expand. And expose is something that research shows over and over that we can do with our kids just by helping, having them help wash the beets or go to the grocery store and help um, pick out some different color carrots. Carrots come in different colors. And a lot of kids don't even realize that asking them, can you go find purple carrots? Let's see if they have purple carrots at this store. And making it an adventure, uh, something as simple as just a pot on the windowsill with some herbs or even cutting off the beet top and replanting it and growing beet greens. You know, mm -hmm. science experiments that are really easy to do, but give the kids the exposure so that they can start to develop a friendship with these vegetables. And then moving into exploration, where you're actually doing, um, uh, making recipes together, and exploration is going to include some tiny tasting, and then we go on to expand, which is a little bit fancier recipes and bigger steps. Not to say that the three E's are totally separate concepts, they do kind of blend together, but they all lead to the fourth E, which is eating. Mm. Interesting. So like none of those things is actually about eating necessarily. You could do all three of those E's without actually eating it. You absolutely could. And the research shows that all of those three E's lead to eating. And that's what the parents want. It's just that parents get um, a little overly focused on the bite instead of the process to getting there. And, and you know, that's why you and I are here, just to yeah. help guide them down that, that path. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, I'm as guilty as anyone of being like, well, I'm not going to buy beets because my kids don't like beets. And so I'm not going to make them. And you're making me realize that it's also, I'm also missing an opportunity then to like, beets are super dirty. They could scrub them in a bowl, which is an activity they love. And yeah. a four-year-old would be much more likely to be like, oh, I did something with that. Maybe like, what are you going to do now? And we could cook it. And um, so I think it's like an important point for all of us to just remember that eating is not the be all and end all. And it's certainly not the first step either. Right, right. You don't become best friends with somebody the minute you meet them, <laughs> um, unless maybe you're in kindergarten. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, but it, you, don't, you don't necessarily develop a lifelong friendship based on one meeting. It is right. several meetings, several play dates, several opportunities to get to know each other. And that's why we follow the three E's. It's funny you should me uh, mention Beats too, because um, on my website and in the first chapter of Adventures in Veggie Land, one of my favorite activities is to take beets and help the kids make washable beet tattoos. And yeah, yeah, so um, I'll try to find you that link if you want to cool. share it. Show notes. Happy yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes at a veryfullplate.com slash 42 is where these show notes will live. And I'll link to all your books and your website, but I would love to link to that beat tattoo activity because that is something my boys would love. It's, <laughs> it's so fun. And you can watch the beats after and still make whatever you want with them. But the greatest thing about it is in order to get the, the beat to make the tattoo, you lick the beat. That's the trick. Oh. And now your kids are licking beats. Yes. Yes. You're yeah. so clever. I love that. Um, so you mentioned that veggies are one of the hardest things and that's why you wrote Adventures in Veggie Land. I'd love to just step back and say like, why is it that vegetables are such a hard thing to get kids to eat? Because my kids will eat fruit all day long, but right. vegetables are more touch and go. Is there like a clinical or scientific reason for that? There can be, there can be. Kids are a little bit more predisposed because of the sweetness of breast milk. 
mm. to um, uh, like sweet. And parents will often offer a sweeter fruit um, as a first food. Or if the child rejects or doesn't seem as interested in some of the more savory flavors, they'll keep going back to sweet and keep reinforcing that. Now, I mean, I love sweet too, and I love fruit, and fruit is so healthy for you. But I think sometimes as parents, we tend to over rely on fruit because we know it is good, and we think, well, at least he's eating his fruit. But really, we want kids to, to eat a variety of foods, including vegetables, so that they get good, well-rounded nutrition. Um, we do tend to be, sometimes there are, there are genetic factors where a bitter taste is stronger to some people than others, but even that can be overcome. And the way we overcome it is by following those three E's. Yeah. That's so yeah. cool. And I think that's just a great perspective. I remember that you shared something. I'm telling you, I've I follow all your stuff. So, so nice. pardon me, dear listener, while I nerd out with Melanie here. Um, but <laughs> you shared something about a vacation where you were trying a new food. Do you remember that post? Oh my gosh. Was it the one where I was trying um uh ooh, sea urchin? I think so. Yeah. I think it was something that was like animal, but I was like, wow, I've never had that before. And it sounds interesting. Oh, okay. It was either when I was in Scotland and I mm. tried haggis. Because I like that's never exactly tried what it that. was. Every time I travel, I try a new food and I try to videotape it. And part of the reason why is it's really fun to show to share on social media, but on my phone, I keep a whole file of me, my kids call me Coach Mel, of me, Coach Mel, trying new foods. And um, we get to watch it together and we talk about some of the things that I'm doing wrong, you know? So they yeah. say out loud, Coach Mel, you should achieve with your big teeth, you know? Or Coach Mel, Funny. you you shouldn't yuck other people's yum and that kind of thing. So I love the kids to be able to tell me what to do because it shows me that they've been listening to our lessons together. Uh, I think on that particular day, it was Haggis in Scotland, and I did not want to hurt the waitress's feelings, because she was literally standing behind me with the camera, <laughs> and it's such, a, you know, it's a, it's a food that they just embrace in that country. That was a hard food for me, and yeah. um, I know I could learn to eat it. I know I could if I just kept taking tiny tastes, and I bet I would even learn to really appreciate it, but just as importantly... There are different flavors of haggis, which I never realized. Everybody has a different recipe, a different twist on it. And I'm sure I would find one with enough tasting that I would really like. And that's what I want my kids to understand is when we get in the kitchen and we cook together, we're supposed to taste as we go, just like professional chefs. And, um, you know, if we don't like a taste, that's okay. That's no big deal. What does it need? Does it need a little more salt? Does it need some dill? What could we do to make it taste better? And I think I could do that with haggis. I just need to go back to Scotland and hang out for a while. <laughs> oh, it sounds so hard. That's such a fantastic point, though, that I think we don't focus on enough because I'll have people come to me and be like, I tried this recipe and I don't like this thing. And I'm always like, you know, recipes are just guidelines. They yeah. are truly, I don't know what you like and I don't know how salty your salt is and I don't know yeah. how you know, bland your beans are or whatever it is. And I think it's an underrated part of cooking in general, but certainly in talking to our kids about food is that we have control. It's one of the beautiful things about cooking, but you have to have enough experience to know what you like to then make some decisions about how to change it. And I don't often talk to my kids about that conversation. We just like taste things as we go. Yeah. Um, the idea of like having them be like, oh, this needs a little salt or this needs a little that and giving their input and their flavor profiles, their preferred yeah. flavor profiles that way. And our, you know, our picky eaters, especially our more extreme picky eaters, they really narrow down the number of foods that they're willing to eat because that's what feels safe to them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was just telling someone the other day that, I know it feels safe to limit yourself to those foods, but that's actually not a safe place to be. That's a trap. That's a trap. We got to help you figure out how to get out of this trap. And one of the ways is to learn to take tiny tastes and be okay with the fact that you don't like it. It's okay if you don't like it. We're just practicing it until we figure out what you do like. So just like you just said, you got to do a lot of tasting to figure out what foods you really do like. And if there's one you don't like, 
you got to do a lot of tasting to learn to like it. Yeah. So is it okay then to ask our kids to try foods? You know, if it's just the garden variety picky eater where there isn't a lot of anxiety around food, there isn't maybe a, a motor challenge where they're having trouble chewing or they don't have some physiological issue like gastroesophageal reflux disease or other medical discomfort, then yeah, I really think it is. For the kids who do have all of those other challenges, my job as a feeding specialist is to use my clinical skills to get them to a point where all of that is resolved or at least at a, a very um, a good comfort baseline level so that they're also able to take taste. And then once I get them there, and it can take over a year, then I start to implement the rule that in our family, we take a taste of everything. But for my kids who and parents who just want to know how to help their kid is a little hesitant and they don't have any other stuff going on, absolutely. We established the rule, sweetheart, in our family, we always take a taste of everything. And we might have something like little tasting spoons on the table so they can truly take a tiny taste and then they can comment on it. But I never ask them to take more than one taste ever. Because yeah. if you just gently encourage them to always take a taste of everything, you know what happens? they keep tasting that same food. And after a while, they'll learn to like that food. They may not love it, but they can eat it if that's what's on on the dinner plate that night. Yeah, it's so funny because we have this sort of expectation of kids that they should like everything. And it's weird if they don't like broccoli or maybe mushrooms aren't their jam. But one of the things I loved about your haggis experience, and I had something similar in Italy, I tried tripe and it was like this huge plate of tripe in tomato sauce. And I was like, I like a couple bites would have been good, but a huge plate of it was a lot like yeah. a lot for my first time. So I'm right. eating with everything, but isn't it funny how we expect our kids to be just eat whatever we say is healthy. Cause we say that they should like it and it's healthy, right? As if they don't have their own taste buds and ideas and experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I think I, it really makes me stop and think about the things that I may have said to my youngest because I'm also surprised. What do you mean you don't like that? <laughs> right. Everybody like that? But yeah, that we're all allowed to have our own preferences. And um, uh, it's, a, it's a process that these mm-hmm. kids have to go through and, and we're there to support them. So we do have to be careful of our language for sure. Right. I, you said having, so my kids are like of the garden variety where they have preferences about things and they have decided that they don't, don't like others in quotation marks. But we have a rule with our four-year-old who's the only one who's old enough to talk that you don't have to like it, but you have to try it. And that's yeah. kind of our phrase. And you know what? It does work well. And he doesn't like everything and he doesn't always take another taste, but he will even tell me you don't have to like it, but you have to try it. It's usually for macaroni and cheese that I don't want to eat of his, but he's like, mom, you don't have to like it, but you have to try it. And I'm like, oh, I know I like it. That's not the <laughs> opposite problem. Um, I don't want to gloss over the fact in case anyone is listening and thinking like, maybe my kid is not a, a garden variety picky eater. Is that something that would be recognized by, by our doctor or how? do most folks come to work with someone like you who can really help with the logistics and yeah. getting them to a place where they can taste lots of things? Right, right, right. You know, such a good point to bring up because, um, geez, I love a good pediatrician. Love them. You know, um, my own brother's a pediatrician. I wrote a book with a pediatrician. But having that close relationship with both of those people has really taught me that Pediatricians have so much to learn about children that they don't get the education in feeding and picky eating and especially not extreme picky eating. And it's really up to someone like myself and you to educate them um, in terms of what the red flags are. So what professionals who may be listening can do is not just educate the parents, but also educate other professionals. Mm. Really, really try to help pediatricians, especially understand that not every kid grows out of it. As a matter of fact, one out of four children will not outgrow picky eating. And we have research to show that. It can be for a variety of reasons. But when you consider that the standard response when we go in for our well checks, and it's well-meaning, 
is for the pediatrician to calm the parent down and say, all kids are 50, just he'll grow out of it. Those are the kids who end up on my caseload when they're eight years old and they're only eating seriously pureed baby food or they eat chicken nuggets, popcorn, and M&Ms. And seriously, that's it. The parents all say to me, well, he said they grow out of it. And th that professional, that pediatrician, that doctor did not mean for it to go on that long, but the kids don't get well checks that often after that. And it's often just to stop in and get some shots that they don't have the opportunity to find out from the parent they have not grown out of it. And my family is so stressed out and we have the most uncomfortable meal times. When parents ask me, when should I look for help? I always say, when you find that meal times aren't enjoyable anymore, mm. if they're not enjoyable, we got to fix something. And usually that's the first sign before anything medical, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. I so appreciate you digging into that because I think that there's something really here. We keep coming back to this in general around like you have to advocate for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. doctors are not magicians and they're not no. efficient. They don't know what's going on in your house. And so there's this thing as parents, but also as adults for ourselves, we have to be willing to advocate to get the help that we need. And I love that idea of like, if mealtimes have become uncomfortable, it's time to push maybe a little bit harder. Yeah, because what we want the parent to be able to say is, well, I will say, I want you to stress that you're stressed, <laughs> that it, 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 the doctors are trying to help you calm down and help you, that's ah, fine, don't worry about it, you know, yeah. they're trying to help you feel better. But if you stress that you're stressed about it, right. really the response we want to hear is, well, let me help you find some help. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to do that. And usually a pediatrician can direct them to either a feeding professional like myself or a local hospital that offers a feeding program. But at the very least, if all they do is have a one hour consultation with a professional, they'll know whether they need to get more. So that is one hour that's worth every cent. Yeah, you don't have to suffer through it yourself. You don't have to suffer through it. And I'm thinking as a parent, I have this example. So my four-year-old is in like the fourth percentile. He's tiny, he's short, he's little, but he eats like a lot of variety of foods. And for me, I've gone to the doctor and said, is this something I should be worried about? And he's always like, well, you know, he's on this, his growth curve has stayed the same and he's growing and all of these things. And I know that afterwards I feel a sense of relief because yeah. I just wanted to know that I shouldn't be stressed, stressed. And I can imagine that if you are stressed and you hear something that's supposed to make you feel better and you still don't feel better, that that's like a good cue. Yeah, so that's, that's a good cue. Up. Such a good point. Such a good point. Listen to that instinct. Listen to your heart. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Parenting is so tricky, isn't it? <laughs> it's so <laughs> nuanced. It is. So I want to um, go back to this idea of like playing with your food and having fun with your food. And I know you have so many of these strategies in your book, but are there any like tools that you love to have on hand to be ready to play with food in the kitchen with your kids? Yeah, yeah. Um, in Adventures in Veggie Land, there's a resource page in the back where I list a lot of my favorite tools. But my big thing is I want it to be inexpensive for families. So one of my favorite places to go is the dollar store. And you can pick up so many child safe knives there. Um, the big plastic knives that we all buy for a dollar to cut heads of lettuce, mm -hmm. those are great for kids. You can also get for a dollar crinkle cutters, which are just, they look like just a, a handle with a little crinkle cutter at the bottom and they will not cut skin, but they'll cut a carrot. Um, I know that they won't yeah, cut skin. Yeah, I'm, there's I'm so always many afraid things. Of peelers, because they're like surprisingly dangerous. I know because I've peeled my fingers like. Darn right, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's good to know that a crinkle cutter doesn't have the same. A crinkle cutter doesn't have the same uh, bloody effect. <laughs> I know, I know, it's awful. Um, by the way, there are also on Amazon, you can get a glove. It looks a lot like Ma Michael Jackson's sequin glove, but it's all silver and it will protect a little hand when they're using a grater or um, some of my older kids will even use some really sharp knives and I'll have them 
have that glove on their hand that they're using in that little cat paw to hold the carrot as they're chopping because just in case it slips, it won't cut through the glove. And that makes you breathe a lot easier when you know your kid's fingers are gonna be just fine and you're gonna have a positive experience no matter what. Yeah, you know, people sometimes laugh at that idea of a cut glove, but at Whole Foods, we used it all the time in the kitchen. It was a professional requirement because knives are dangerous and, you know, this is with adults, not just kids. Yeah. Um, and so, like, it's important to make sure that everyone is safe. So I love that idea of letting them explore without maybe, like, the dangerous side effects of Get well, and also, yeah, just like you did in a professional kitchen, using the language and teaching them the language that when you are holding a knife in your hand in a kitchen, you're going to say sharp, sharp as you move about so that other people know not to suddenly turn and get that knife. Um, and also when they lay the, the knife down on the counter, how to do it correctly so that no one accidentally puts their hand on the sharp blade. Um, how to wash a knife correctly. So really educating kids because eventually they're going to be able to use a sharp knife and we're going to do it step by step to keep them safe. Such good points. And I'm smiling over here because I'm thinking there's a lot of adults that don't know those things either. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's worth talking about is like, why do you not ever put a knife into a sink, right? I mean, right. I've done it and I've also suffered the effects of it. So um, <laughs> reasons and talking to our kids about that sets them up to be safer. I also think it kind of makes them feel important, you know, like they yeah, special and that they get this privilege and opportunity and that makes, that elevates everything they do in the kitchen as well. Oh, that's such a good point. Definitely. Yeah. I love the idea of like empowering kids. So the salad knife, I must admit that I've bought those expensive kids knife kits. I mean, they're not super expensive. There's like three knives for $20, but this, this idea that I could have gone to the dollar store and gotten a salad cutting knife is ingenious. <laughs> I have lots of, that. lots of professional products that I'm more than happy to share the links with, but the dollar store is to me the happiest place on earth. I can find so many cool things in there. And you know what, if you show up with a new tool, when you're trying to tempt your child to come in and maybe make a veggie dish with you, mm -hmm. and you have this new tool that only costs you a dollar, that's totally worth it. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's really simple things too. Like this is so funny, but my son and I were in Ikea and he really wanted, um, a hand egg beater. Oh like, yeah. Yeah. So hand. fun. So fun, which I would never have purchased because I have a stand mixer that never gets used. And I'm like, I certainly don't need an egg beater that I have to use by hand, but he just thought it was the coolest thing. And we use it in the kitchen for baking things and you can put veggies and muffins and all that, but he also uses it to play with soapy water and other things. So there's yeah. like a lot of uses for these tools also. You know, I love that. And another example is, have you ever seen those exfoliating gloves that they're like a little glove and they're for exfoliating in the shower, right? Yeah. Those are fabulous to keep at the kitchen when you bring in those beets that you were talking about and they're all dirty and the kid's like, I don't want to wash those give him those fun gloves to put on and he can exfoliate the beads. So especially for kids who are a little bit more tactically defensive, having a tool on hand like that that helps them feel more comfortable in that environment is so important and they're so inexpensive. Yeah, exfoliating gloves, that is ingenious. I'm gonna have to get some of those because I feel like even my one and a half year old, he wants to help so bad. Yeah. <laughs> so unhelpful. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to another question I have, which is like, how do we manage, so you've convinced us that we want to um, expose and explore and expand with our kids, and that part of that is getting them in the kitchen and doing things with them. How can we let go of some of our stuff around that of like, oh gosh, this is going to make a mess, or oh my goodness, they're going to mess it up, or those kinds of things. Do you have tips for parents around that? Yeah, because you know what, I'm, I'm a realist. <laughs> <laughs> I always talk about the importance of getting messy and really exploring food with all of our senses, but there are just days where you can't do that. And um, I recently just wrote an article about that and I'm happy to share a link. It'll give you a bunch of ideas, but let me just give you a few tips right now. So as a parent, when you know it would be really helpful if your kid could interact with that food in, uh, by exposure, exploration, et cetera, et cetera, but you just don't have the time to hose them down afterwards. Then think about um, think about what you could do that 
would limit the mess to the hands only. So here's one example. I think sometimes as therapists, we get really focused on kids digging their hands into mashed potatoes or painting with pudding or whatever it happens to be. If we don't have time for something that messy and we're trying to save the shirt sleeves too, then just take a little bit of that mashed potato or that pudding, or if you're working on guacamole, for example, take a plastic bowl as a parent and just take some guacamole and just rub it around the inside of the bowl. Now the kids can draw in it with one finger or they could take an inexpensive clean paintbrush and paint in it and they're having a great time. It will keep a toddler busy for a good 10 minutes while you're trying to do something else. So um, the beauty of that is, you know what you have to wash is a bowl and some fingers. So you can always just scale it down, just scale down the mess when you're not in the mood, but the kids are still having fun and making friends with the food. I love that idea. What about if we're willing to make a mess? Do you have any like tried and true ways oh, to yeah. sort of contain that mess if you're really going to go for it? Yes, 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 yes. Um, I just, I'm, I seriously really want to encourage everybody to take a look at the 20 different activities that are in Adventures in Veggie Land. My favorite activity of all time, it is always a winner, is I'll just go to Costco and I'll get some pre-made mashed potatoes. They're so inexpensive. And a lot of times they'll also have sweet potatoes or I'll just microwave with one sweet potato so that I can have some sweet potato mash. And you help the kids take the white potato and build a volcano. And then you take the sweet potato and you make the flames and the lava and the fire coming out of it. And then just take some, um, oh, I love plastic dinosaurs. I'm kind of obsessed with them. You know, dinosaurs can be all around the volcano. I've never had a kid that wasn't really getting involved in the mash within about 20 minutes. As hesitant as they might start, because mm. they don't want to touch it, they can't help it. It's just so much fun. Here's a tip though. Keep a bowl of warm water right next to them. So if it starts to become too much for some kids who are more tactile defensive, they can just do a little finger bowl, you know, and they can just wipe yeah. off their hands, get a towel, and then get back to it whenever they need to. I love that simple idea of just like having a bowl and how that can make them feel better. Cause I know my four-year-old, he is hesitant sometimes around messy foods like yogurt. Cause he yeah. doesn't want to, he doesn't like getting messy and he doesn't want food on his clothes and it's kind of adorable, but also like totally annoying as a parent as many things <sighs> are. And yeah. I realized that sometimes it's just my fault that I don't have a napkin ready for him where he could yeah. feel comfortable. Like if I get messy, I have this easy solution. And obviously building a mashed potato volcano is a more extreme example, but how easy to be like, of course they need a bowl of water to wash their hands if mess bothers them. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm glad you brought that up too, because a lot of times in therapy, we will keep a damp washcloth by the child's side, but I just want to caution everybody about that. I, I'm not totally against it, but sometimes we'll run into these kids who are holding that washcloth constantly. It's like their security blanket. And when you're doing this with a washcloth, you're not doing this with mashed potatoes. Right. So I really like your suggestion of a paper napkin instead. A cloth napkin would be fine too. But the beauty of it is, is that we put it on our lap and our legs are under the table. So it's not a visual cue to constantly be doing this. Instead, it's there if we need it. So yeah. just another um, thing to think about when we're trying to encourage kids to get messy, but they also need some training wheels essentially to get there. Cool. I love it. So if there's like one thing any of us listening can do today to raise a more adventurous eater, I'm sure we've covered it already, but what would be your like number one takeaway that all of us parents listening can go do today? The most important thing, whether you're going to practice expose, explore, or expand, is to make it a positive experience. Don't get overly focused on the bite. It's about having fun together. It's always about having fun. Fun always leads to eating. And plus, remember, kids are filing these memories in their brain, and you want them to look back at this time together, whether it's at the farmer's market or at the grocery store or at the, in the kitchen cooking, as a really, really happy time, because those are food experiences. So always make sure they're positive. 
That is so awesome. So in that vein, would you recommend that if we are going to indulge in one of these activities and work on a new food, that it happens in a time and space where we can really dedicate some energy and attention? And Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But also, as you said, keep in mind, you could also just be him washing the beets while you're getting the rest of the dinner ready. So I think sometimes parents make it too big in their mind. It's awesome. If you're going to make a mashed potato volcano, that's a really fun, dedicated time to do something. But don't shy away from little minutes of time where there's an opportunity to make friends with the food. Amazing. Well, I know that folks are going to want to hear more from you, Melanie, because you have so much goodness to share. Um, I know I want to really get Adventures in Veggie Land because I could totally see my four-year-old like opening it up and deciding on something for us to try together, which is always fun for me if I don't have to be creative and think of the idea. <laughs> um, but what other places can folks find you and learn more about the work that you do and how you can help all of us raise more adventurous eaters? Yeah, they can just go to MelaniePotok.com. And be sure to go to all of my social media as well. Right on my homepage at MelaniePotok.com, you'll find all of my social media icons. You can click on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube. I have over 100 YouTube videos, no commercials, no ads, totally free for parents to learn more about how to raise an adventurous eater. They can also check my homepage for um, wherever I'm gonna be in the United States or next month I'm teaching in Australia. So I'm traveling the world. Uh, and I would love for them to consider one of my four books as well. Uh, it ranges from babies up to elementary school age, tips for all kids and all parents. And you're absolutely right. The whole idea behind Adventures in Veggie Land is that when the kids open it up, that it's so colorful and it's just so inviting that they cannot help but say to mom and dad, can we make this tonight? I love that so much. So all of those links to Melanie's books and her website and seriously, you guys, you have to follow her on Facebook. I've just gotten so many wonderful gems as you can tell here, but also just like cool stories about buying broccoli and all kinds of just <laughs> gentle, loving encouragement, which I just think you're so talented at Melanie for how us parents can work with our kids. So thank you. Um, you guys can find that at averyfullplate.com slash 42. And Melanie, I just want to thank you so much for taking your time to be here today. And for those folks who listened in, thank you for giving us your time to learn a little bit more about how to raise an adventurous eater. Thanks for having me. I'd love to do this again. Yes, I would love that. There's so much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs>